Thousands upon hundreds of thousands of dollars for equipment. Where is that old time pick and shovel now? Welcome to the Decrypting Crypto Podcast. This is Series 1, Episode 4. We're going to be discussing how you can understand mining. I'm Austin Knight, and I'm joined by my co-host, Matthew Howells-Barbie. Hey, Austin. Hey, everyone. So we're going to be talking about mining today. And honestly, the best way to think about mining is mining is like the farm to table of cryptocurrency. We showed you in episode two how you could get some of those delicious Bitcoins into that wallet of yours. Now we're going to actually help you to learn where they actually come from. We're going to do this by discussing the three major functions of mining. First, how new coins are released into circulation. Second, how transactions are processed on the blockchain. And third, how security is provided to the network. Right. And this is a pretty technical topic. And I have to be honest, me and Austin have like bounced back and forth a lot on how do we distill this down into something that doesn't just sound like complete gibberish. So... Bear with us a little bit during this episode. We feel pretty good that we've got enough, though, that's going to give you a good enough grasp of mining that you can at least be able to figure out that it's not someone digging with a shovel in their back garden and getting some Bitcoins out of the ground. So let's, let's start a little bit here with what actually are some basics behind blockchain technology. We've talked a bit about this in a few previous episodes. And we've been hinting towards us covering what is blockchain in a bit more detail. And I want to talk about this in the context of a payment for some goods being made with Bitcoins. We've talked in episode one how you would transfer some Bitcoins in relation to how you transfer normal USD. We haven't actually talked about how you kind of pay for something. So let's imagine we're going to buy some coffee. And we're going to pay for that with Bitcoins, which coincidentally you can do in some places. <laughs> Funny story, not to go on a tangent. I saw recently an article that KFC in Canada, I'm not sure if you, you heard this, Austin. <laughs> KFC in Canada released the Bitcoin bucket, where you could get a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken for $20 worth of Bitcoin. Nice. Oh, yeah. Soon to be $100 worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So... So I need to buy my Bitcoin bucket. What's the first thing I need to do? So first of all, I need to understand what's the amount of Bitcoins required that I need to send. Second, I need the public address of the seller. So one thing to kind of think about here is I think we'll move into a time where we almost have like Bitcoin debit cards. But for now, we would just need this public address, kind of like a bank account number. I create the transaction in my wallet. And that transaction is sent to the blockchain. And the blockchain being the public ledger that we've kind of talked about that stores all of these different transactions, will have that transaction so that everyone can see it there. That not necessarily me, Matthew House Barbie, has sent this, but my public address has sent this amount of Bitcoin to this other public address. This is then where things get a little bit more technical. So when we say this transaction is sent to the blockchain, what does that kind of mean? Because for KFC to be able to give us our, I'm sure, delicious Bitcoin bucket, they need to see that that transaction has been confirmed and that the Bitcoins have been received in their own wallet. This is done through mining. Now, one thing that I want to cover with the blockchain, and it's, it's important to understand this, is that each individual cryptocurrency has a blockchain that operates slightly different to one another. Bitcoin has the Bitcoin blockchain. Ether has the Ethereum blockchain, etc., etc. Slightly different rules, but a large amount of the general basics apply. And that is that a blockchain, as a piece of software, is broken down into what we call blocks, hence the word blockchain. Those blocks, you guessed it, are connected in a chain. And these blocks 
are created to store transactions. So when a new block is created on the blockchain, this happens every 10 minutes automatically with the software. A new block is created and new transactions can be added in to that individual block until the block is full. Yeah, and on average, there's about 2,000 transactions per block on the Bitcoin network, if we take that as an example. That's at its current one megabyte block size. Yeah, and this, it, it's, it's useful to almost think about a block kind of how you would like a, a USB flash drive, right? It's like this USB flash drive has a certain amount of capacity that it can store files. Now, in the same way, transactions actually have like a file size in bytes, almost like a Word document, right? And in this case, the blocks on Bitcoin have a one megabyte size, kind of like a little bit less than an old floppy disk, if you remember. So there's only a certain amount of transactions that can go into each block. When a block is completely filled and it's been what we would call completed, it's stored permanently on the blockchain cannot be changed by anyone, is visible for everyone to see, and that confirms all of the transactions within it. They are now set in stone. Those Bitcoins have transferred into KFC Canada's hands, and I am thoroughly full with my Bitcoin bucket. It's also worth knowing that we have not been sponsored by KFC Canada. Uh, <laughs> Though if they're interested. <laughs> we could like eat some chicken live. I think that would add to the sponsorship deal maybe. Um, <laughs> but when, and, and this is the important part of all of this. Well, I mean, it's all pretty important, but here's like an important part from a Bitcoin point of view is when a block is completed, which happens like every 10 minutes, new Bitcoins are freshly minted and added into circulation. Right now, like for every block that is confirmed and added and completed successfully and added to the blockchain, 12.5 Bitcoins are added into circulation. And this is exactly how new Bitcoins are released into the economy. Every 10 minutes, as blocks are filled with transactions, they're added to this ledger. Think about a block almost like a page on an accounting ledger. As soon as that page is turned, new Bitcoins are added, and it's every 10 minutes. That is then the basic overview of how the blockchain really works. So where does mining come into all of this then? That's the word that we hear mm. getting tossed around, right? Right. So you're probably thinking as I'm going through all this, it's like, all right, cool. So a transaction goes into a block, a block is completed and Bitcoins come out. Like, how, how does that happen? Who does it? Is there a person spinning a large wheel in a room somewhere, maybe like in China that's just powering all of this? <laughs> maybe, we, we don't know yet. But really what's happening here is, if you think about powering a piece of software like this, let's think about Google. When I type in a search into Google and I get all these results, that happens through software, but electricity needs to power that software. There needs to be that data stored somewhere. Like where is Google's data stored? Google has huge data warehouses that are almost like the size of countries by now. And that's what powers all of this. Bitcoin uses miners. And a miner really is, one thing I need to make clear is not a small child. It's a minor E-R-S, not O-R-S. And they will use the processing power of their computer, also known as a node, which you'll sometimes hear, to power the transactions and power the blockchain. Now, that sounds like a bit sci-fi, something out of Star Trek right now, but instead of basically having a huge warehouse full of 100,000 different servers or computers all powering these like complex transactions and algorithms, what you have is you may have the same amount, 100,000 computers, but they're each individually owned by anyone around the world. So what's happening here is mining actually begins at the moment a new block is created. So as an individual miner, you hook up your computer with some software, like the Bitcoin mining software, and it runs completely automated. So you kind of for all intents and purposes, just press a button and go, leave your computer on, and it uses the 
processing power out of your graphics card or your processing unit. And to be clear, in order to do this effectively, you're not going to like buy a Chromebook and just run this on it. You you need a, a bit of a powerful machine. Right. And I think we can come into like what makes it profitable <laughs> a little yeah. later on because that's a whole different story. But I mean, in reality, could you buy a Chromebook? Could you use your exact computer that you're using right now? Absolutely. If you don't care about, are you going to make a profit? And we'll explain even what that even means, make a profit, right? So the important thing here is you hook up your computer, use over that processing power. And what it will do is whenever a new block is created, the whole goal of the miner is to solve a complex math problem that the software creates that takes a lot of processing power to be able to complete. So usually it's focused around understanding the prime number used to basically be multiplied against a number of numbers, which enables once solved for the block to be completed. Now it kind of sounds like a weird thing. It's like, wait, so a computer goes on, solves a math problem, and now all of a sudden we have transactions. What we're doing here is it takes very little processing power to actually just pile in a bunch of transactions that are being sent into the blockchain. But to secure that block and make sure no one can change it, it requires a huge amount of processing power. And let's say one single person was able to solve the math problem. These math problems are incredibly intensive on the, the processor of your, your computer and your graphics card. You'd probably need a warehouse that's the size of a small town to be able to solve like a block on your own. And this is where the collective power of all of the different computers on the network actually come into play to solve these complex math puzzles. So this term mining or miner, it can be a little bit misleading. Makes you think of somebody that's actually physically digging for a Bitcoin, but that's not exactly what's happening. A little bit more of an accurate description would be that they are powering and securing the blockchain by lending their computer's processing power. And the more computers are involved, the more miners are involved, the more nodes are involved, the more secure the network is because you're reaching consensus amongst a much larger network of computers. But the miners aren't just doing this out of the goodness of their heart. There is a financial incentive. And so that kind of brings us to the question, like, how does this work? What motivates people to become a miner in the first place? Good question. As much as I would love for the incentives of powering the whole Bitcoin movement to be through completely altruistic motives, there is a financial incentive for this. So near the start of the episode, I talked a bit about how when a new block is completed, new Bitcoins are pushed into circulation. What I meant by when I said they're pushed into circulation, they are given as a reward to the miners that helped solve that block. So let's say I'm an individual miner. My, I have this like a number of machines that I use to help power the Bitcoin network, and I maybe contributed towards 10% of solving the previous block that just got completed. I will get 10% of the reward that's given out for that block. And the reward right now is 12.5 Bitcoins. This is the financial incentive. Not only that, but there are also transaction fees for every transaction. So one big thing that's been happening that's a kind of contentious point is Bitcoin's transaction fees have been rising a lot. I think we're talking around December of last year, there were periods of times where transaction fees were above $10 per transaction, if not even more. Something sometimes they hit like $15. Times that by 2000 in terms of the number of transactions in that block. And all of those fees get distributed out to miners. And when we say $10, $15, $4, that's not actual dollars that they're receiving. They're just fractions of a Bitcoin. Exactly. So it's the dollar equivalent exactly. of Bitcoin. And because the value of Bitcoin is in flux, the dollar equivalent can get pretty out of control. Exactly. And that's where we tend to just kind of work on a general average. Now, the interesting thing here is around the reward. So I said, look, the, the current reward for completing a block on the blockchain, processing all those transactions as a miner, is 12 and a half Bitcoins. But it hasn't always been that. When the Bitcoin blockchain first started, it was actually 
50 Bitcoins per block reward. So you would have had significantly higher returns in terms of raw Bitcoin you'd have been rewarded with compared to now. Now, why is that? So the main reason behind this is the rewards for miners solving a block actually cut in half every 210,000 blocks, which roughly works out at four years because there's a new block every 10 minutes. Actually, the next date when we're due to half this down again is, I think, around the 12th of June in the year 2020. This is interesting when you get into this because you realize, well, this is incredibly predictable, right? And there's another interesting thing, which we will not touch on in this episode, but eventually all of the Bitcoins that are going into circulation will be in circulation. And then the only reward for miners will be transaction fees. That's a whole like rabbit hole here, but that's how you can think about how people are financially incentivized. Let's say that this sounds good to you. You're listening to this episode and you're like, all right, I'm starting to understand this. Um, can I become a miner? Is this something that I can actually do? Is that possible, Matt? Can literally anybody with a computer and an internet connection become a miner? Do you know, every time you say that, all that comes into my head is someone transforming into a child. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the reverse Peter Pan. I think <laughs> like it's very off-putting. I wish there was a better word. So the answer is, can anyone become a miner? Absolutely. There are even some blockchains that allow you to mine via your smartphone. And look, you're not going to be able to mine a huge amount because it's all proportional to the processing power. You have a, a really expensive desktop PC that's maybe like a gaming PC that's like really high end. That's probably going to mine at a much better rate than you would with your iPhone 3G original, right? Like you, you, can't, you, you can't make a good comparison there. But in short, all you actually need to do, regardless of your device, is download the mining software to your computer and you can pretty much get up and running with a few little bits of setup in amongst that. There and then today, you just need to decide, okay, which coin am I going to mine? Because you can mine most coins. And do I need to have like a wallet set up for that so that where do they actually pay me for my block rewards? And then you just kind of leave your your computer on. One thing I would say is as someone who has mined a whole host of different cryptocurrencies over the past few years, don't expect to be using your computer while you do it. It's basically having a consistent heart attack for the entirety of like the mining <laughs> stage. So it's completely maxed out. You're not going to be able to start like running slide deck presentations whilst you're mining your precious Bitcoin. You can try. You can absolutely try. <laughs> and if you find a way, it'd be... I, Please I, I, do. Yeah, show me. So then the question is, okay, so anybody can mine. Mm -hmm. We kind of know what goes into that, but you're dealing with a lot of competition, right? In fact, there are entire conglomerates that are focused on mining. So is this something that even if you can do it, can you do it profitably? Is it worth doing as an individual? Mm, that is... A good question. So if we phrase it as, can anyone mine profitably? Not really. <laughs> like you say, you're competing against a bunch of other miners. The reason why you're competing is everyone wants to solve the block, or at least solve the largest proportion of it so they get the most of the rewards. If you have a really low spec computer and you're trying to like do mining with that, and you're competing with someone who has 10 times the processing power of your computer, they are always going to do better than you. So your rewards are going to be much, much smaller. And in particular, when you are on more established blockchains like Bitcoin, people have been mining for a long time and they've been investing in more and more machines. The, the, the irony of all of this is that actually, if you look at some of the mining operations, that there's, there's whole businesses in particular in China that have just built huge data warehouses that will... Basically, just all they'll do is mine Bitcoin. And they're actually responsible for an alarming amount of the whole processing power on the Bitcoin network. I mean, when you think about Bitmain, which is a Chinese company that focuses more on like building hardware for mining, they also mine a lot themselves. I think they own 
near enough forty percent of all of the processing power of Bitcoin. That's that is absurd. Is one word for it, right? Like, and I think that's being very polite. <laughs> that mm-hmm. It doesn't seem that decentralized when you look at it like that. Yeah, that's a problem. But coming kind of back to this, there's also there's there's a lot of ways that there's been specialized hardware, in particular what are known as ASIC computers, computers specifically designed to perform mining at an incredibly high rate. Kind of like how a smartphone has a processing unit designed specifically to run applications, right? And it's designed to perform well at doing that. So one specific use case, basically. Same with these ASIC miners. People invest a lot into these types of hardware so that they can mine at a much greater rate, get more of the rewards. This kind of brings on to if you feel, okay, well, maybe I'll have I'll have me a piece of that. Where am I going to get my ASIC miner from? That's where you kind of get into the costs. And there's two layers to this when you're thinking about if you're sitting there saying, Matt, Austin, I'm in. I want to, I want to mine some cryptocurrency. I just need to figure out the costs. What would it take for me to become profitable? You know, the first thing, which is the fixed costs, right? Fixed costs is basically building what's known as your mining rig. That's a, just a term that makes it sound more awesome for computer. And that's what you're going to be running your entire mining operation through. So you need to figure out, all right, if I invest in this graphics card that costs, say, $1,000, I'll be able to mine at a much higher rate. But I need to make that $1,000 back. So what do I predict I will make? And, and there's some like online calculations. There's a good website actually called whattomine.com that goes through some of this. And then the ongoing more variable costs, which are much tougher to think about, is, and in the case of Bitcoin and most blockchains that run what we call proof of work, is the electricity costs. And that can get complicated. Especially, interestingly, Depending on where you are located in the world at the time of mining, this can be a huge advantage or a disadvantage. If you're located in the States, electricity is expensive here. This alone could be the thing that makes this not profitable for you. Yet in Brazil, electricity (laughs) is cheaper and easier to get your hands on. And the equation can kind of work itself out that way. And I think that's why we see a lot of the mining industry flooding to like rural China because electricity is so cheap. One of the big worries that people will say with Bitcoin is, well, what happens if, I mean, we mentioned a couple of episodes ago about at one point China banned all ICOs. We're going to be talking a bit about ICOs in a later podcast. But what if China said, do you know what? It's illegal to mine Bitcoin from tomorrow. We just talked about how 40% of Bitcoin's network is run by pretty much one Chinese company. I think when you look at China as a whole, it's around about 70% of the network. That would not be good. Yeah. (laughs) That's risky, right? And it creates this dynamic of, okay, certain places are cheap that can make it profitable. I've even seen... um, subscription-based services where you pay- It's like a software as a service, almost. 100%. You're renting a server to mine coin for you. So you don't have to build a rig. You just go to a service where they have a huge data warehouse and you can buy in, almost like the ostrich egg pyramid scheme. (laughs) (laughs) Buy an ostrich egg and never see it in your life. (laughs) Buy a mining rig, never see it in your life. But of course, the question there is continually, like, is that a profitable venture? Right, because your ongoing variable costs are predictably lower. You've just got to pay for the upfront fees. The challenge is, with all of this, is defining what profitable is. Now, if costs could remain all the same, and Bitcoin could double in price, let's say you're uh, mining Bitcoin. Bitcoin doubles in price, all of that Bitcoin that you mined before is now worth twice as much, which means you're twice as profitable. Happy days. That's great. It could also halve in price. And then all of that Bitcoin that you mined that you thought was profitable is now not profitable. In fact, you lost a lot of money. That is the dynamic here that's tough. And when you're thinking about mining, a lot of people love running to smaller cryptocurrencies because they say, okay, well, 
this cryptocurrency is, I believe, undervalued and I'm going to mine it in an early stage and I'm going to make a loss for at least a year. But I'm predicting that this will jump in price so that everything I've mined has all of a sudden jumped up and it's going to make me profitable in the future. There is an element of uh, spinning the roulette wheel here, but it's all part of the the idea of actually being able to determine whether something's worth mining or not. So what if you want to get started? And honestly, I personally think mining cryptocurrency, even if you did it for a day or a week, or just to go through the process, is one of the best ways to get your feet wet and learn about crypto. It's a bit of a minefield as well, because you're going to run through a bunch of forums when you're trying to problem solve stuff. And it's just tons of really technical people that speak very technically and can be very uh, intimidating. But one of the first things I ever did, and my actually my introduction to cryptocurrency was mining Bitcoin. And that was something that really I did without really knowing what I was doing at the time, but it helped shape how I understood the whole blockchain to work. Of course. It allows you to make a much more informed decision about what you're going to be involving and investing your time and your resources into. Matt, you had an awesome analogy that that you shared earlier that relates to this a lot, where if you think about uh, how people are choosing to invest in cryptocurrency right now, most of it is based on the market cap or the value of the currency. And that's what they're using to guide their decision. Oh, okay. Bitcoin is worth this much. It's grown this much. So I'm going to buy Bitcoin. But you had an interesting point and you said, well, you know, that's not usually how you buy things necessarily. You wouldn't go looking to buy a car <laughs> and say, I'm going to just pick the car from the car company that's worth the most money. Yeah. Similarly, you, you probably wouldn't want to do that with a cryptocurrency. If you want to really understand a car, you'd spend some time in that car. Maybe you'd look under the hood. Maybe you'd give it a test drive. Mining is very similar to giving a car a test drive in that you're giving the cryptocurrency a test drive. Absolutely. And I think even if you're not even thinking about, hey, I want to make some money. And I think this is something me and you talk about a lot, Austin, is Getting involved in cryptocurrency, if it's just to make some money, is really not the good way to go about this right now. You need to invest time to understanding the technology. And to do that, you can also help support these projects moving forward. Like you can set up with a new project, help mine some of the cryptocurrency of that project. And that helps secure the network, helps process transactions, helps it get off the ground without, without mining. Bitcoin is doesn't exist. That's, that's a really empowering thing, I think, from a community point of view and a social point of view that people that are, okay, being economically incentivized to do this are also the ones that are ultimately putting the power into the network. Okay, so you've convinced me. <laughs> How do we get started? How do we actually do that? As Matt said, first, you're going to need to decide on what you want to mine in the first place. And we mentioned a website a little bit earlier. It's whattomine.com. That's really useful for this. It gives you a good overview and you can kind of get a sense for where you want to put your resources. Once you've decided on the cryptocurrency that you want to mine, you need to download the mining software for that crypto. And you can usually find this within that cryptocurrency subreddit on Reddit. You can see there's a pattern for some yeah. reason Reddit is driving <laughs> a lot of this. Or maybe you just do a quick Google search. When, yeah. when in doubt, Google it. Then you're going to need to create a wallet or a link to your existing wallet so that you can deposit those funds when you receive your rewards from the mining process, and you're pretty good to go at that point. Yeah, and just just one thing, you, you may see a number of different mining software programs for different coins. Like, just do a little bit of reading. Some of them have their advantages, some of them don't. In all honesty, like, just get up and running and see how this is going. What, one, one interesting thing, actually, that I came across when I was mining and playing around in all honesty with Monero, which is like more of an anonymous, a much more anonymous version of Bitcoin. There's There's been an interesting application where certain websites, when you visit them, are leveraging your processing power as you visit their website to actually mine Monero. This is like 
a super shady area. But like businesses are trying to like think about how do we move away from just ad revenue to supplement our website. And some people are asking, hey, do you mind if we mine Monero when you visit Others don't site? ask at all. Your your computer fan just turns on and you're like, hmm, somebody's having a hard day on the internet. <laughs> right. And actually what's happening is you're mining a cryptocurrency and you don't even know it. Yeah, except you're not getting the rewards. Exactly. <laughs> so, And I think we're going to see more and more interesting applications of mining along those lines, but it's, it's definitely something to just bear in mind. So I know we went through a lot in this super technical Let's just recap a few things. So mining ultimately solves three things. It mints or releases new coins into circulation, helps process transactions on the blockchain, and ultimately provides security across the whole of the blockchain that you're operating within. Anyone can go in and be a miner. All you need to do is set up your computer and download the software and get going. Not everyone can be profitable, but at least using some of our general guidelines, you should be able to go in and start figuring out how you would go about calculating how to become profitable or if it's even worth your time. So homework for the end of this episode. I would just recommend picking a random crypto, checking it out, seeing what it's like to go mine it. And you know what? When you've made your millions, you can feel free to drop me and Austin a few of those <laughs> sweet cryptos over to us. <laughs> Make sure you join us for the next episode. We're going to be talking all about the applications of wider blockchain technology beyond Bitcoin, beyond payments. It's going to be super interesting. I'm really amped to talk about it, and I think it's going to broaden the spectrum of your knowledge as a listener as to what blockchain can actually do in the future. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and want to show both myself and Austin your appreciation, we'd love it if you could spend some of your time adding a quick review on the iTunes store or your favorite podcasting platform. You can also check out and visit us at thecoinoffering.com. Follow us on Twitter at thecoinoffering. And you know what? You want to just shoot us a quick email, chat to us, make suggestions, tell us how terrible we are. Send us an email at podcast at thecoinoffering.com. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy the next episode. Here's a sneak peek at our next episode. This is where you, you start to think about your involvement in all of this and how big it can become and how much this can not only transform currencies, which is what everybody is talking about, but transform the entire fabric of society. The contents of the Decrypting Crypto podcast should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.